for people unfamiliar with you, please tell me your name, uh, what your back, what's your background, and what have you been doing for the last 20 years? <laughs> All right, my name is Pam Popper. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'm the president and founder of Wellness Forum Health. Our practice specialty is informed medical decision making. And essentially what we do, and this is what we've been promoting for the last actually 24 years. I can't believe we've been in business that long, but we have. Essentially what we do is help people understand that the way that you buy cars and houses and retirement accounts and blenders and washing machines and college educations for your kids, or you check things out and you ask questions and you deliberate a little bit, that's the same way that you should be purchasing information about health where you check things out, you document, you think about your own value system and what's important to you, and then you make a decision about it. And of course, that encompasses all kinds of things like diet and lifestyle change, which becomes a shockingly valid alternative when you start to see what some of the other treatments and drugs and things like that that are offered by the traditional medical profession, the, the actual efficacy rates can convince you you should take better care of yourself. So that's where we um, really work with people on changing their health in productive ways. So that's what I've been doing for the last 24 years. Is alcohol a cause of death? The media often reports that it's part of a healthy diet. Well, first of all, sometimes uh, when alcohol is discussed, the recommendation is just consume in moderation. You hear that a lot about a lot of things, by the way. Eat dessert in moderation. Um, you should do everything in moderation and then you're okay. Well, here's the problem, first of all, with moderation as a term when we apply it to food and beverages like alcohol. Nobody knows what it means. And actually a very good research study was done on this topic and the researchers concluded and reported that the definition of moderation is how much of something people really like that they want to have right now. <laughs> <laughs> and they can justify it in their minds by saying, you know, okay, if I ate four toaster pastries, I haven't had any for three months, so that's okay. And if I have 11 drinks, well, that makes up for the three months before that I didn't have any. So, so this game of moderation that people play when they're trying to figure out anything is really a bad idea. Now, when it comes to alcohol, there's no question that it's a carcinogen, that it causes heart disease, it causes atrial fibrillation. Um, there are all kinds of reasons not to have it. Having said that, I don't necessarily think that people have to be a teetotaler. I'm not. Um, what I do tell people is alcohol is a treat. It's not a health-promoting beverage. Consuming it in moderation, nobody knows what that means. So we have a category in our food scheme, our food pyramid, at the top called treats, and this is special occasions and birthdays and that sort of thing. And I really don't think that if you had six or eight or ten cocktails during the course of a year, you're going to end up hurting yourself. But our problem in our society is that because it has been promoted, particularly wine, as a health-promoting beverage, people are drinking alcohol every day thinking that it's contributing to their good health, and it's not. Um, one other thing I'll mention, and I don't know how many people know about this, but it's significant in, in terms of the perception of alcohol, and that is that, uh, well, actually, two things I'll mention. The first one is that the National Institutes of Health actually had put together a program where the alcohol producers were going to fund a $100 million study that was guaranteed in advance to show that drinking every day was health promoting. And they had collected, the NIH had collected uh, about $65 million of the money. And the New York Times broke the story. And of course, there was no choice but to refund the money and back out of the deal. But the emails that were um, obtained between, and the slide sets that were used to do the presentations to get the producers to come up with the money was, we will show you. If you give us this money, we will deliver to you research that shows that daily drinking is health promoting. The other thing is that the research that has been done on alcohol is very skewed. And you know, it all depends on the structure of your study. So much of the research was done on people who are social drinkers, and there's a lot of room to roam there too, and people who were former drinkers. Well, the social drinkers always came out better in a lot of these studies. Well, why do people become former drinkers? Well, they become former drinkers because they have an alcohol problem, because they have liver or pancreatic cancer, because something serious happened to them, they had a heart attack. All right, so when you compare the social drinkers to the former drinkers, the social drinkers look better. But one study that was done, and I think it was in 2014, someplace along there, they compared the social drinkers to the never drinkers. 
all benefit disappeared, except for women my age who had less than two drinks a month. They, they had a tiny, hard to find, statistically significant benefit uh, from drinking. But, but um, the research has been quite skewed. The alcohol industry has done a very good job of making sure that its representatives are part of uh, state, local, federal, um, and world uh, health organizations and committees that determine what people should eat and drink. And um, I, I think they're almost smarter than the tobacco producers from that standpoint in terms of uh, really getting themselves in the middle of the policy making so that their story about the health promoting benefits of alcohol, however false it might be continues to be perpetuated. It's a treat. It's a, you know, I don't think, I've always said that, I don't think that a piece of birthday cake is going to kill you. What will kill you is eating cake three times a day. You know, cookies on a holiday morning, not a problem. Cookies for dessert, lunch and dinner are a problem. So if we, we I really think to get people to comply, to do this in the long term, we have to be careful that we don't impose such a level of restriction that we just lose them. On the other side of it, a lot of dietary plans are really permissive, thinking that you can't get anybody to do this unless you let them do anything they want, which then you miss the whole point of what we're trying to accomplish, right? How do we avoid getting Alzheimer's or dementia, and what can we do to protect against this? Alzheimer's is becoming, and dementia, big problems. In fact, the fastest growing segment of the nursing home business right now is memory care. And one thing you don't want to do is end up in memory care as a senior, right? Um, interestingly enough, the same type of dietary indiscretions that lead to cardiovascular disease lead to Alzheimer's. And this isn't hard to understand when you think about the fact that the brain is the biggest utilizer of water, glucose, oxygen. How does the brain get this material? Through the blood vessels. So if you damage your blood vessels, you can have a heart attack, you can have a stroke, you can end up with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are very, very clear studies showing that there's a very clear link between um, intake of copper, too much iron, too much, um, too much of uh, saturated fat, animal protein, et cetera, in a dose-dependent manner. Um, another thing that I'll mention that gives us a clue as to the cause of Alzheimer's disease is that it is so geographically specific. In other words, there's no dementia and Alzheimer's disease in Okinawa and Papua New Guinea. You don't see much of it in northern Africa where they're still living on a diet based on starch and tubers and that sort of thing. Where do you see all the Alzheimer's disease? It's in westernized countries like the United States, Norway, Australia. And so anytime you see a disease that has chosen specific locations, there's probably something about the habits of the people that's influencing the disease. Now having said all this, I think there's another part of remaining cognitively sharp that we should always pay attention to. Um, eat the right food, as I just mentioned, plant-based diet, low in saturated fat, low in iron. Um, people who eat a lot of animal foods take in way too much iron. So low fat, plant-based diet, and then make sure you're hydrated. Even a 2% drop in water levels in your body can cause uh, some cognitive decline. Not really noticeable, like nobody would say, that guy must be dehydrated today, it's not making sense, but, but you, you are less sharp. Um, the other thing is using your mind. And the unfortunate part of growing older in our society is people, their world shrinks. So you have to go out of your way if you're 80 or 90 years old to make sure that your world doesn't shrink, that you're socially engaged, you're learning something new. One thing that I tell our people all the time, our members and our clients, is almost every university and, and college in the, in the United States or every state has a rule that if you're over 60 years old, you can attend classes for free. Now, if you want to get a degree or something like that, you have to pay. But if you just want to go learn about religions of the world or horticulture or something you always wanted to study, you can go sit in class all day long. It's the best thing that seniors who don't have anything to, to do can do. My father got the equivalent of a horticulture degree at Ohio State University and after he retired. Kept him busy for a long time. He was working in the experimental garden. and So I can't really underestimate or over um, uh, express how important it is to pay attention to using your mind, social engagement, things to do, places to go, places to be, that sort of thing if you want to remain cognitively sharp. Did people eat animal flesh three meals a day 150 years ago? 
Well, the short answer is no. And we actually have a lot of evidence to prove it. One of the best ways we have of knowing what people ate is technology that allows us to analyze the plaque and teeth, and you can tell what people were eating. Even the Neanderthals were eating a starch-based diet. So having said that, the, the paleo people don't like to hear this. It aggravates them terribly. But, but if you just look at this from a logistical standpoint, you know the fastest runners in the world, the people who are running in the Olympics, they're not fast enough to outrun animals. Think about it. We had no weaponry. It's not like you could stand from a distance and shoot these animals or no bows and arrows. There was nothing during that Paleolithic era. And so this is a ludicrous, on its face, a ludicrous assertion that somehow we were able, in spite of those limitations, to shoot and kill or to kill and eat animals. Now, my favorite story that the paleo folks come back, they always have stories, they never have much science, but my favorite story that they come back with is that we were doing, back in those days, what's called persistence hunting, right? So you chase the animal until the animal's worn out. Well, I don't know if you've ever chased an antelope. I don't think there's a great chance of that happening, but let's say, for the record, you could do it. Well, then, then once the animal was worn out, then the humans could kill the animal and eat it. Well, my question is, how did the animal get back to the campsite? There were no cell phones, as far as I know, back where you could say, hey, I've just killed an antelope, tell you where to meet me, bring the family. I don't see the guy hauling the thing back, you know, five miles or whatever. So any way you look at this, whether it's from an energy standpoint, how much energy output you have to exert to go kill the animal, from a speed standpoint, you can't find any way that this theory works. But I'll finish with this, because I think this is maybe the best thing of all. I do not understand why we sit around thinking and hypothesizing about what people ate millions of years ago, because we have very accurate data on what people are eating right now, what their health outcomes are. We don't have to hypothesize. We have it. It's in medical journals. You and I can go read it right now with a great deal of assurance. And I think that's much more reliable and what we should be spending our time on. What's your opinion on when it makes sense to take antibiotics and when it doesn't? When it t makes sense to take any drug, including an antibiotic, is when the risk that you're going to take is worth the benefit you're going to get, all right? We overprescribe antibiotics. And it's a two-way street. Doctors overprescribe them. And then patients and their parents ask for them. And so doctors overprescribe, but then they are reluctant to not overprescribe because they're getting demand from the parents. And they're prescribed for things for which they can't possibly help, like viral infections and things of that nature. But, but here's the thing. If you really do have a life-threatening bacterial infection, an antibiotic will save your life. So people say, well, antibiotics are terrible because they destroy your gut bacteria. Well, if you're going to die from a bacterial infection, you're better off being an alive person taking a probiotic than a dead person with an intact gut, right? So, so the risk-benefit ratio works out to take the antibiotic. So going back to what I was talking about earlier about being an informed consumer, that's really what making smart medical decisions is all about. Here's the risk I'm going to take, the benefit I'm going to get, and do those things work out, or is it skewed in favor of not taking the drug? What do you do if you have autoimmune disease? Autoimmune diseases are different. Um, they're all similar to one another, by the way. It's the same mechanism. The, body, the body's immune system is misbehaving, and it has lost its ability to tell the difference between you and not you. So your immune system should be going after bacteria and viruses and things that can hurt you, not your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, and your thyroid, right? Um, the different thing about autoimmune diseases is unlike cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and many forms of cancer, those are pretty much foodborne illnesses. You eat your way in and you eat your way out. The issue with autoimmune diseases is they're caused by a number of different things. So you have to address a whole lot of different things in order to fix it, right? So 78% of all autoimmune diseases are diagnosed in women. There's a very strong hormonal component. And in many instances, hormonal dysregulation actually is in the medical history of the woman. So you'll see PMS, irregular menstrual periods, heavy bleeding. Many of these women have taken oral contraceptives in order to control their menstrual cycles and be able to live <laughs> normal lives. Um, infertility, fertility treatments, that sort of, so there's a hormonal component. Vaccinations. In fact, the, the language in some medical journal articles is quite clear that vaccinations can cause autoimmune because it abnorm the vaccinations abnormally perturb 
the immune system, and if you do that enough times, um, you'll, you'll end up perhaps switching it on and you won't be able to switch it off. Allergies are precursors, so that's a situation that has to be addressed. The gut microbiome has usually been damaged. That's where your immune system is controlled. So the key to addressing an autoimmune disease is the diet has to change. There are additional restrictions for people who have autoimmune disease. You have to fix the gut microbiome. You have to fix the hormonal imbalances. Um, you have to fix the allergies. You have to have some strong consideration about whether or not you're going to continue the vaccination schedule because some of the worst flares of autoimmune diseases happen post-vaccine, particularly for flu. Um, so those are the things that you have to do to address autoimmune. The problem with, the, with, with conventionally raised livestock and farmed fish is that it's so contaminated antibiotic steroids and hormones um, that, that you can't afford to eat it. And, and maybe, the, uh, for one thing, the hormones are an issue, but back to our discussion about antibiotics, the antibiotics are a life-threatening issue. You know, 70 some percent, varies depending on what study you look at, but over 70 percent of antibiotics manufactured in the United States are injected into or in the animal feed of um, livestock and farmed animals and fish. And they do this for two reasons. For some reason that nobody's ever been able to determine, antibiotics stimulate growth. So you can grow the fish and the pigs or whatever you're growing faster. And the other thing is you prevent infection in these very overcrowded facilities. Well, we really are reaching a place right now where antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections, we're, we're going to have sooner or later something catastrophic happen if we don't change our ways in this area. So people who say, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life, if you've been eating conventionally grown animal foods and farmed fish, you've been eating antibiotic with every meal that contained that stuff for a very long time. Should everyone supplement with B12? Is one type of B12 better than others? And how do you make sure you get enough B12? Yeah, so B12, the B12 requirements for adults, really small, 2.4 micrograms a day, very tiny amount. Um, most people don't need to supplement with B12. Vegans who eat no animal food and who eat no processed fortified foods need to supplement. But most plant milks, most of us are taking in, I, I happen to eat a vegan diet, I'm taking in enough B12 from fortified plant milks and things like that that I don't need to take a, a B12 supplement. Um, in terms of the type of B12, I don't think it matters a lot. I think a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands like to sit around and ponder these types of things that are not so significant. <laughs> so if you're a vegan who doesn't eat processed foods that, that are fortified, then you should take a B12 supplement. Um, the problem that we have is the B12 supplements on the market are huge doses. I mean, it's difficult to find something even as low as 50 micrograms a day. And um, I remember when I first started in this business before I really became a nut about the science and I was repeating things other people told me, I would tell people, oh, you can't overdose on this stuff. There's no, there, there's no evidence that, that it can hurt you in big amounts. But as I got smarter about all this and I started doing my own research, um, there is some evidence that huge doses can hurt you and that um, there really have never been controlled studies to determine the upper tolerable limit. So be cautious in taking it. Yes, you should take it if you're a vegan eating no fortified foods. Um, I will say this, interestingly enough, most of the B12 deficiencies take place in people eating animal foods, which are rich in B12, so how can that be? It's because there are more gastrointestinal disorders in people who eat an animal foods-based diet. So they have problems in their GI tract, including the production of intrinsic factor, which allows you to utilize, absorb and utilize B12. So the fear is always when, when particularly people who promote an animal foods-based diet, oh, all those vegans are going to be B12 deficient. Look at your own population. They're much more likely to be B12 deficient than any of us. Should we take blue-green algae, and are there B12 analogs in it that cause real B12 to not be absorbed properly? Well, that's a complicated issue. I, I don't think any, there's any mandate to take blue-green algae. And I think people would be better off if they focused on food and spent their money on high quality food than a lot of the supplements that they buy. I think supplements should be subject to the same risk benefit ratio. And the fact that you don't know what the risks are because it's never been looked at should scare you a little more than it usually does. But in any case, the, the, the problem is not that the analogs in, in blue-green algae are going to interfere with 
you know, taking a B12 supplement. As much as it is that the analogs are often promoted by people who don't know better as a substitute for being concerned about B12. So and when we were talking about B12, if you're, if you're eating a vegan diet, you don't eat any fortified foods, and you think you're going to take an algae supplement, and that's going to provide you with the B12 that you need, you're going to be sadly mistaken. And although it may take seven or eight years for you to develop a deficiency because the body stores and recirculates B12, eventually bad things are going to happen. Brian Clement from Hippocrates Health Institute recommends all beans except soybeans and black beans. Do you agree with this? I can't imagine why there would be a problem with soybeans or black beans. You know, this is hard enough to get people to do, to eat well, without putting restrictions that just make it harder. Uh, and I have never seen any evidence, and I'd like to see if there is some. Please give it to me. I'm happy to review it. I usually don't hear from people after I do that. It's too much work. Talk is cheap. Evidence requires effort. So it's easy to be me because I come up with the evidence. Your job is to refute it if you're going to take me on on this issue. And then you have to work hard. People don't want to do that. That's just an aside, by the way. But anyway, I've never seen any evidence that there's a problem with soy or black beans. Some people say beans and grains didn't exist until 10,000 years ago and therefore are not our natural foods and our bodies aren't programmed to eat it. And therefore, we're meant to eat animal products. What does the best science have to say about this? The best science is laughing at that statement. <laughs> I'm laughing at that statement. The, here's, the, here's the issue. First of all, the statement is false. Um, everybody always equates the beginning of agriculture to the end of health. And uh, food stability is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, if you want to go visit some places in the world where there isn't food stability, you could become a great fan of farming right away. All right. Um, but, but in 10,000 years, let, let's assume for a moment these people are right. Let's give them that. In 10,000 years, humans can adapt to eat almost anything. Had, had we decided at that point in time to be carnivores, our entire digestive system would have changed. Right now, most of the enzymes that your body produces are amylase. That's an, an enzyme that, pr that uh, digests starch. So we would be more like my cat at home. He's a carnivore, so he's got enzymes that digest fat and protein. All right? So we would have become more like carnivores over 10,000 years if we were supposed to eat animal foods. We started eating, let's say we started 10,000 years ago eating beans and grains. We've evolved to eat beans and grains. We've adapted to that food supply. And the problem with the paleo diet, well, there are a million problems with the paleo diet, but the people who promote this is what they don't understand is you take people who are eating you know, basically a plant-based diet, maybe a bad one, you put them on a paleo diet, they're not adapted to eating that type of food at all. They're the, it's the reverse of what they're saying. Should we soak our beans and whole grains before eating them? The short answer is no. If you want to, it's fine. I don't really try to interfere with people who want to make work for themselves. I want to juice, I want to soak, I mean, whatever. What I have trouble with, and, and why I feel like I have to speak out about it, is when people make this so much work that nobody will do it. We have to get people to do this. And their job, all day long, I talk to people about food and diet and all this stuff. That's my job. And I also have the luxury of a lot of time to do this kind of thing. I don't soak and juice, just for the record, all right? But we, we have got to start making this something that busy people can do without giving up their jobs and locking their kids in the basement so that they can prepare food all day. <laughs> it's just not practical, a lot of the advice that's being given. Can too many cooked beans and whole grains raise our blood sugar and make us pre-diabetic or diabetic? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, the people on the planet, the populations that have the lowest incidence of diabetes, eat a very high starch diet. In Okinawa, the diet is 69% of calories from sweet potatoes. Papua New Guinea, it's 90%. In Africa, Northern Africa, they're living on tubers, Asians eating rice. So it's a starch-based diet, and beans and grains are starchy foods. So no, you, you don't get diabetes from eating beans and grains. You get diabetes from eating protein and fat instead of beans and grains. It's interesting you should ask this question right now because you know we own a school, and uh, we attract really brilliant people from all over the world who want to be involved in nutritional science and that sort of thing. And one of my students in India, who is one of the best researchers I've ever had in class, I mean, 
I enjoy reading her papers like I enjoy reading novels because they're that good. She just wrote a nine-page paper on the, on the science showing that eating protein and fat leads to type 2 diabetes, eating starch and plants the opposite direction. And uh, so I'm going to publish it in my newsletter. The ultimate honor in my world is that I use your articles instead of mine <laughs> in the newsletter. And this is one that's earned that, uh, uh, that um, honor. But uh, no, eating beans and grains is not how you end up getting diabetes. It's the opposite. And yeah. you can eat your way out of type 2 diabetes, eating beans and grains. Does it make a difference for health if you eat beef from organic grass-fed cows versus factory farm cows? Well, it's, there's no question that eating cleaner animal food is a better idea, but it doesn't change the health outcomes from eating too much of it. If you, again, looking at population studies, looking at historical data, the people who end up in trouble are people who eat animal food as the center of their diet. Around the world, we don't really see any indigenous vegan populations, but here's what all the healthy populations have in common. Animal food is like a condiment. It's not the main dish. So if you and I were living in Ethiopia right now and our mom was fixing dinner, she'd have a big thing of tubers and vegetables and all this sort of thing, and then you slice up 8 ounces, 12 ounces of goat meat, and it seasons the dish that serves 11 of us. Okay, That's an entirely different thing than in our world where You've got a dinner plate and a huge chunk of meat, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, beef, chicken, whatever, is on the plate, and then everything else is the accompaniment. So I think that when animal food, better, the, you know, organic animal food is, is minimized to that very tiny condiment, you know, two, three times a week maybe, um, it's fairly safe. But you can't skate the danger and the health risks associated with eating a lot of animal food by, by buying better animal food. What do you drink during the day on a typical day being as specific as possible? Well, I'll be real specific. Water. <laughs> um, I'm good for a cup of coffee every day. And in the wintertime, it was uh, four degrees when I left Columbus. So I like hot tea, but I drink at least 64 ounces of water every single day. And more when I'm sweating and exercising. I have a hot yoga studio in my building. We own it. and so more water on the days I go to hot yoga. What can women do who are having bladder problems and can't fully control when they urinate? Um, bladder problems, both in men and women, you have to get to what is the cause. And sometimes it's structural, particularly for women who've had difficult childbirths or C-section births. And some, you have to surgically fix it in some instances. Um, if it's not, um, incontinence can be um, fixed by changing your diet. There's a condition called interstitial cystitis, which has some features of autoimmune. So dietary change can help with that. Um, another thing, there's a form of physical therapy, and, so, and it's a specialized form of training. So you need to see a PT who's actually done the training uh, that can help women uh, learn to, to reverse that condition as well. So the solutions range from simple dietary change to surgical, depending upon the cause. How does someone protect themselves from getting arthritis, osteoporosis, or bone loss? Okay, well, those are different conditions. Okay, osteoporosis and bone loss have some are the same thing, but arthritis. A lot of arthritis pain comes from weight gain, because let's face it, if your if your knees and your ankles are carrying your weight and you're 100 pounds overweight, walk walk around with something that weighs 20 pounds for a while and see how that feels, and then think about what that must be for your poor joints. So, weight gain is an important part of uh, of why people become arthritic. So don't gain weight. Um, there's another aspect of weight gain that people don't talk enough about, and that is that um, fat cells pump out inflammatory cytokines. So your your general inflammation levels go up, and that can affect your joints. Um, being sedentary is a risk factor because when you move, um, that's how your, your joints produce synovial fluid that it stimulates the production of synovial fluid that bathes the joints and keeps the joints in good working order. So those are some things to do. Eat a plant-based diet because the diet itself can be inflammatory. Animal foods are very high in arachidonic acid, which is a precursor to inflammatory hormones, prostaglandins. So your diet, your weight, your exercise patterns, all of those things bear on um, how well your joints are going to hold up. Um, in terms of bone loss and osteoporosis, uh, there are three or four things that, that make for good bones. The first thing is understanding that your bones are living tissue. 
I think that, that some people think that they get a skeleton, it grows to its full size when you're 18 years old, and then that's the skeleton that you live with for the rest of your life. Well, from a structural standpoint, it is, but the bone, but the bone tissue turns over and you get like a whole new skeleton at least once a year. So what stimulates what we call it bone remodeling? And this is where microscopically little pieces of bone are resorbed and then rebuilt. Um, and it goes on all over your skeleton all day long. Well, same thing as similarities to arthritis, movement does. You have to do movement, weight-bearing exercise to stimulate bone remodeling. Another thing is eat a low acid diet so that your body isn't forced to borrow minerals from your skeleton in order to buffer the acidity and keep your blood pH where it needs to be. Uh, sunlight, so you make vitamin D. And make sure that your gastrointestinal system is in good shape, particularly your microbiome, so that you're absorbing nutrients from food. And then that will impact not only the health of your bones, but everything else. Because if the food is passing through you and the nutrients aren't getting in, that will not only lead to bone loss, but can also lead to a lot of other diseases as well. Please tell us what you eat for breakfast on a typical day, being as specific as possible. No, I'll be really specific. I'm a creature of habit. Some people say I'm 62 going on 125 because I like things the way I like them. But anyway, my breakfast is typically a smoothie. And what goes in that smoothie is we have a vegetable powder mix at the office. And I put that in there, eight ounces of almond milk or something like that, um, some food grade green tea, a tablespoon of flax seeds, a tablespoon of brewer's yeast, a banana and frozen fruit and I whip that up in a blender, and it's about 20 ounces, about 14 grams of fiber. And then I have two pieces of toast with fat-free hummus. So that's breakfast. It's a big breakfast, but I, I start at five in the morning, and what I wanna do is do my work in the morning and then go to yoga, run, gym, whatever I'm gonna do for exercise, and then I have to wait till lunch to eat because you don't want to eat all that right before you go to the gym, right? So a lot of food to carry me through the morning. And I have that every day when I'm home. Do you recommend eating raw cacao nibs or raw cacao powder? I would rather people have some fabulous dessert than, that, that is a treat and keeps them on track. There's no magical powers that cacao powder has, like I have to eat it or I'm going to get some disease or whatever. So again, looking at this, I look at things from a much more practical standpoint because we deal with people in, all over the world who the goal is not to make a huge impression on them for two weeks and never see them again. Our, our membership base is very stable, so we follow these people over a long period of time. And we feel that our ultimate measurement of job performance is not how they're doing two weeks after they interact, begin their interaction with us. How are you doing a year, two years, three years later? It's the compliance that we're looking for. So again, let's, let's go back to there's no magical food, including cacao powder or cacao nibs or whatever. What people do want is they want cake on their birthday. So let's take all that energy that goes into cacao nibs. Let's have cake on your birthday so you can live like a normal human. That's another thing. People are always concerned about the, the resistance that they get from everybody else. And some of it's justified. Some of the behavior makes people in your life think that you joined some strange cult over the weekend and you need to be deprogrammed so you can rejoin humanity. So we want to stay away from anything that kind of leads people to that conclusion. So that's a longer answer than you probably wanted, but, but some of the stuff that you're asking me is tied up in a bigger issue, which I think we have to pay attention to. What diet and lifestyle recommendations do you recommend to avoid cancer? You know, to avoid cancer, I think that, that there are several things you have to do. The first thing is you have to stay lean because fat cells pump out hormones, inflammatory cytokines. So you want to eat a diet and, and engage in exercise that keeps you lean. Um, a plant-based diet, low in fat, and plant fat can be just as much of a problem when it exceeds 15% of calories as fat from saturated fat. So, so you can't have olive oil and copious amounts. I see people eating hands full of nuts and that sort of thing. It does not work out well for most people. So a low fat, plant-based diet. There's another thing too that I think is important to, to mention about cancer. Is, and, I, and I really have changed my stance on this since I started, because I really used to look at cancer as only a biological disease. And that's where diet and exercise and weight comes in, hydration, those things. Um, but Dr. Kelly Turner wrote a very interesting book called Radical Remission. She interviewed 1,000 cancer patients who were terminal patients who didn't die. And the objective was to find out what they did to survive, which I think is some interesting data for cancer patients. 
And a thousand, well, she, she found out that the thousand people she interviewed, she was able to identify 70 some strategies that they use. But the interesting thing is the thousand people who didn't know each other all use the same nine. Number one, diet, what we're talking about here. Um, but the other eight were just as important. And those included things like being in control of your health. Their doctors described them as annoying, okay, because they asked so many questions, they didn't do just what they were told. Well, the time to start doing that is not when you have cancer. It's, it's before, because a lot of medical treatment leads to cancer. You take a drug for autoimmune, and one of the side effects is cancer, all right? So you start asking, you start being annoying now, not then. Another one was, um, was, was having strong social connections, which we were talking about with Alzheimer's. Um, another one was, was getting rid of things in your life that don't serve you, really, really figuring out your purpose in life. Writing, if many of the cancer patients said, I, I feel like I got this cancer for a reason, and if I could figure that out, I'd be able to live. And they often did. These people led very out of balance lives, they weren't happy, uh, that sort of thing. So I don't think that you can focus on these other things to the exclusion of diet and lifestyle. I think you have to do it all. I think to, to avoid cancer, your best chance of avoiding it is you live a healthy diet and lifestyle. You, you eat, exercise, stay lean, drink water every day. And then you pay attention to your life. And, and another book that I read years ago made a huge impression on me was written by a minister who said that he spent time with cancer patients in the hospital. And he said the number one thing that people said is, I'm sorry I got this cancer, but it was a big wake-up call for me. So if you're watching this, let this be a big wake-up call for you before that happens, that if life is not right in your world, fix it. And I'll tell you a funny story about this. That uh, I don't know if this will make it into the tape. But, but anyway, after I read Kelly Turner's book, and I eventually got a chance to meet her and hear her speak, um, I thought, I took this to heart. And, and I have a pretty great life. This is about four years ago. But I changed some things. And it was subtle stuff. I didn't make any big announcements you know, or anything like that. But I remember after a couple, three weeks, people at the office were saying, what's going on with you? I'd say, I, I don't, what do you mean? Well, I don't know. You just seem happy. You know, do you have a boyfriend? And <laughs> people were asking, I said, no, no boyfriend, nothing. Hmm, well, I don't know, there's just something different about you. And I think what it was, was you don't have to do much rearranging in your life sometimes to just make things, you know, better, nicer, calmer, less stress, you know, that kind of thing. Based on all of your scientific research, review of nutritional studies, and your personal experience, what do you think would be most effective actions for a person who has been diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, good question. Um, the first thing is you, you stop poisoning yourself in many instances. You know, I talk to cancer patients who are drinking wine every night at dinner, and they're carrying the extra weight, and they're not exercising, and they're dehydrated, and they skip breakfast and eat bagels and cream cheese at 10 o'clock, and you have to stop that. Another thing, and it's closely related to that, is I think that a lot of people in our culture have a, 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 a self-care deficit. It's like everything in the world is important but taking care of myself. And I think you have to reverse that. Taking care of myself is the most important thing because if I do that, then I'll be able to do everything else. You know, so if this interview had been scheduled for five in the morning, I, I'm up at that hour. But I don't want to be doing this at that hour. I really need time to you know, get myself waked up and, and uh, eat the right things and all that sort of thing. You know, and, and pe but people are the opposite. Oh, you want to interview me at 5? I'll just get up at 4. I'll eat breakfast at 9. That's, that's a bad way to live. You know? so, so I think that's a big part of it. I have them all read Radical Remission, sometimes because what they need most is a dose of hope uh, to people do live through this. Um, the third thing is to calm down and take time to make a decision. This is the hardest part of it. It's easier to get people to eat well and exercise at this juncture because they're panicked and they'll do it um, than it is for them to resist the pressure that they're getting that we have to do the surgery a week from today and uh, three days later we're going to do the port so you can start the chemo. Um, this is the time when informed decision making is really important and I'll tell you why and this is the message I think that's so important for cancer patients to hear um, and I teach by analogy so I'll use one here. A type 2 diabetic can come to one of my events, listen to me speak and say I like the paleo better and so the person goes out they eat a paleo diet for a year and then they really find out this is not good 
So they come back and we start working with them to eat their way out of the type 2 diabetes. 99% of the time, happy ending. When you're a cancer patient, you make the wrong treatment decision, you often don't get the do-over. And so what happens to a lot of cancer patients is that they, they start down the path of treatment because they trust their doctors and they find out this isn't working out so well. The problem then is that they are so much sicker and weaker. The cancer is back, it's back with a vengeance. Their bodies have been weakened by the treatment and strategies that might have been more effective several months or two years ago now don't work. Last but not least, and this is a very important caution, the cancer industry is very polarized and you have people on one side that are in academic medical centers. We take it, we take the cancer out through surgery, lots of radiation, lots of chemotherapy. Then you have people over here saying, stay away from all of that. They're both dangerous, including well-meaning people on this side over here saying, you don't want any chemo, you don't want, and, and I just wrote an article on this topic. The data are very clear that the, the cancer survivors are people who take the best of everything. In other words, chemotherapy in and of itself is not terrible. It's the way it's used that ends up killing people. And so um, a little bit of chemo to shrink something so the margins are clear so you can take it out. My gosh, since 1850, when we had the use of anesthesia and sterile operating environments, we've been taking cancer out with pretty good outcomes, if you can get it all right. That's not a bad idea. You know, taking chemotherapy for a half a year because there might be some stray cancer cells in your body, that's an insane idea. But, but we have to be very careful that we don't go to these camps where people are staking out territory and you're either in my camp or this camp or somebody else's camp. You, you, you've got to look at this from a scientific perspective and that's where you get the happiest endings. And, and I've seen over the years many people who had a death sentence survive and gosh, Kelly Turner wrote a book about a thousand of them. But, um, but they, were look, they were basically doing the right things and they were not falling into somebody's camp. That's why their doctors said they were annoying. But you want to be just as annoying to the alternative practitioners as you are to everybody else. Was prayer one of the nine things? Um, spirituality, spirituality is, yeah. You have to have some kind of grounding. And, and um, you'll hear this later, but Dr. Peter Bragan says that, uh, and it's kind of aligned with that, um, you can never pursue happiness and get it. What you do is you live a principled life and that leads to happiness. And a principled life is having your spirituality intact, whatever that means to you, that you have some grounding there because it gives you the basis by which you're going to interact with everybody else. That's where the principled living comes from, you know. So yeah, it was important to these people. What do you recommend for patients who have candida, brain fog, or high sensitivity to sugar, and what results have you seen from people who follow this advice? Okay, well the first advice is if you've been diagnosed with candida, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you don't have it. It's one of the favorite false diagnoses of alternative practitioners. See, I'm just as hard on my own kind as I am on the, on the traditional medical uh, profession. So most of the time people don't have it. Um, it's, a, it's a favorite misdiagnosis. And while people are chasing around after trying to eat less fruit and some of the other crazy things that they have people do, they're missing what's really going on, which is the person's eating a terrible diet, they're dehydrated, they're carrying extra weight, all kinds of un, un, unaddressed health issues. Um, in terms of um, brain fog, there is no such thing. Uh, there is um, a, a form of brain fog. It it's, uh, it's results from chemotherapy. It's a common side effect of, of chemotherapy. Um, it doesn't always pass, and it's because it's so severe. It's a, it should be disclosed to patients before they, as something important to consider before they sign up for chemotherapy because it goes into that risk-benefit ratio that we've been talking about. So brain fog is another that kind of goes along with the crowd that are diagnosing I'll tell you what the diagnoses are. Candida, brain fog, adrenal fatigue. There's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. It does not exist. It's a made up condition. I've written papers on this stuff. Happy to provide if you want to read them. Um, heavy metal toxicity, soy allergy, uh, undiagnosable Lyme disease or persistent Lyme, and subclinical hypothyroidism that cannot be identified with a blood test. Those are like the seven hallmark diagnoses. Now, do some people have these things? Yes. But 99% of the people who are being told that they have them don't, and some of them don't even exist, right? So we don't treat, not, one of the first things we do is we tell people we don't treat fake diseases <laughs> in the office. We just think it's a good policy to, to have. Um, in terms of sensitivity to sugar, 
I think everybody is to a certain extent. I don't know that that's a condition in and of itself. Um, and the more you don't eat it, the more apparent it becomes. And in um, and, and, and ways that some people don't even think about. So I don't eat, I mean, I don't, I don't try to be perfect. I don't, I think it's a trait nobody can achieve anyway. But um, so I don't eat a lot of really processed stuff. So sweets for me is, um, is smoothies and fruit and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But, but when I do have something, it doesn't take very much, you know, to, to make you a little agitated or, or whatever. And, um, and you don't, I mean, it's, it's tastes good, but you don't need a lot of it. So I, I don't know that sugar sensitivity is actually an issue. I think that might be another one of those things that everybody experiences it. And if you're eating enough of it that you're having a reaction, you're probably just eating too much. You need to eat the right things every day. What are the top causes of death? And are these things we have control over? Well, I'm going to surprise you with this answer. Um, the number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. Number three is medical treatment. And at number three, that only includes death from mistakes and things that happen in institutions. It does not count the people who die outside of a facility who die of medical treatment that was incorrect or too much or whatever else might be going on. So yeah, you can do something about all of those. I mean, almost all heart disease, cancer can be prevented. Not all, but most. You know, some people really do have a bad genetic hand, and, and that's unfortunate, but most of it's preventable. Um, you can't prevent all medical error, and it can happen even with well-meaning people. But what you want to do to avoid that is stay out of the medical mill. See, it used to be, and I'll tell you how people get into the medical mill. It used to be that medicine was set up to treat people who had problems. You went to a doctor and said, I have a symptom. My head has been hurting for six weeks. It's not going away, and I'm beginning to think something is wrong. All right, so diagnosing and you know, doing whatever testing you have to do to find out what that is and treat it is warranted. But we don't do that now. We take healthy people, and the idea is we're going we're gonna to poke and prod till we find something wrong. And a lot of times the things that they find that are wrong aren't even disease. They're risk factors for disease. But we're treating the risk factors as if they're disease. And now you've got a healthy person who's been sucked into this system and made a sick patient who spends a lifetime of tests and treatments. The treatments and the drugs bring, wrong, bring on uh, more side effects and more treatments. And, and that's the medical mill. So, so you, and, and it teaches people to be so hypersensitive to their symptoms. And I, and I don't mean to be dismissive, but I actually have people saying things like, I've been noticing I get a lot of hangnails lately. Do you think that's a skin cancer? I should be worried about that. You know, my elbow hurts. I hope I don't have bone cancer. You know, th this, is, this is silliness that has been indoctrinated into people that you pay attention to everything that happens to you every day. I, and I send emails to people every day. People write and say, I have a headache. I write back and say, well, how long have you had it? 14 minutes before I emailed you. I mean, do you get headaches all the time? No. Okay, probably it'll go away. If you get a cold, it goes away in about seven to 10 days. You get the flu, it goes away. Most things the body takes care of. So I think the, the key, the, because it's very important, it's the most controllable thing of, of how people, uh, cause of death is medical interaction, is to limit your interaction with the healthcare profession to only when you need to be there. I teach by analogy, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this because this, is, this is, really helps people understand. Um, I live in a house that's 30 years old. I bought it 30 years ago. I still live there. I've maintained it. It's a big investment. I've taken care of it. So just think about if I put something on Facebook and said, I want every contractor in Franklin County to come to my house tomorrow morning at 9, and we're going to walk through this house, 3,000 square feet of house, big wooded lot, full basement, and we're going to look for stuff that's wrong. And, and I'll tell you what, if you see something that you think is going to break or you know, have, need maintenance in the future, you fix it, my insurance company will pay you. I'd be under construction until I was 105. That's a lot different than when you call the plumber and say, my sink is leaking. I need a new garbage disposal. The furnace filter needs to be changed, or the furnace needs to re be replaced because it won't turn on. That's a whole different thing. So treat your body the way you would maintain your house. Because we live in this age where we're all about preventative health care, and it sounds like, if I'm hearing you right, we're almost just taking that way too far. And the, pre the best preventative health care is to eat a plant-based diet and do the things Take that we're saying. Take care of yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'll tell you this, I have never read a story of a centenarian, and I read a lot of them because I just think it's fascinating because I want to be one. I've never read one, a story, where the person has said, you know why I live to be 100? Because I regularly saw my doctors. Every time they said have a test, I did it. Every time they told me to do something, I followed through. In fact, you almost always see the opposite. You know, I ate well, I'm taking care of myself, I've had a great life. Uh, great kids, love my community, great friends, enjoy the things I do, um, haven't been sick, you know, that sort of thing. You haven't been sick because you haven't been made sick. You can make anybody sick if you poke and prod long enough. I'm sure at 62, if you examine this body enough, you'll find something that we could talk about. But do I benefit from knowing about it? Usually not. What should we do to prevent cavities? Well, to prevent cavities, your diet has a lot to do with it, of course. Um, your oral hygiene has a lot to do with it, brushing your teeth, flossing. Uh, some people are more prone to them than others, and that doesn't, they can do everything right and still have dental problems, but I think it's mostly a diet-related thing. One other thing I'll mention, um, acid reflux is one of the major causes of, uh, of dental ca of, of cavities. Um, and damage to the tooth enamel is common uh, side effects. So getting rid of reflux, which is diet related most of the time, diet and weight related. What is wrong with chicken and what proof or scientific evidence do you have to justify your belief that chicken should not be eaten? Well, I don't think chicken should not be eaten. Um, I, I think that um, you shouldn't eat conventionally raised animal foods, chicken or otherwise. Um, I think that organic chicken or beef or whatever it is that you're going to eat, wild caught fish, as long as it stays under that 10% of calories threshold, which translates to about two to three times a week, you're going to be healthy. So if we wanted to scare everybody about chicken, and we should scare people about conventionally raised chicken, I mean, just tell people how, it's, how, how they raise chickens in these factory farms and nobody would ever eat this stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean that all chicken is bad. And again, I, I'm looking at compliance. And I'll, I'll give you an example that, that I think is important. So I have a client in uh, Columbus, had a heart attack in a stent, um, who adopted this diet about four years ago. And it was, it was a difficult transition for this person. Um, he eats animal food once a week, about once a week, not always, but on average once a week. And he's been compliant uh, for four years. Very low fat, lost 60 pounds, his IQ is higher than his cholesterol, he's not taking those drugs anymore. Um, if the cost of compliance is one serving of animal food a week, I mean, we, we got to stop losing, winning the, the battle and losing the war, you know. I, I would put a lot of my very small animal food eating clients and their long-term health up against the two-week vegan any day. I'll win. As opposed to these people that cycle in and out of these dietary plans. In fact, since I started appearing in movies and writing books, a lot of our members come having tried this a lot of times and it didn't work out so well. And so now we're going to go about this a different way so that it's something you can live with and do in the long term. Now, do they screw up? And they, yeah, they make mistakes. But, but again, the long term, doing most things right, is what we're going for. I always feel like I have to put things in perspective. Yes, no answers sometimes are misleading. Would you recommend chlorella or spirulina as a part of a whole food plant-based diet? I don't think they're necessary. You know, again, and, and, and this goes to practicality. People have, people usually have some kind of a budget. Occasionally you find people who it just doesn't matter what anything costs, but most people even food is part of a budget. And what we want to do is we want to get as much of that budget into mainstream things that benefit everybody. So, you know, look at it from my perspective. I've got a family with, you know, two adults and three children. And we want them all eating a lot of plant food. And, um, and it takes effort to go buy and prepare and all that kind of thing. And, and so where do we want those resources to go? Food. You know, Corella for five people is very expensive every month. If you, if you really, really, really had to have it, well, I'd make a strong case for it, but you don't. So let's spend that money on really high quality food and um, again, more sustainable over time. 
Does eating cholesterol increase blood cholesterol? And does increased blood cholesterol correlate with increased heart disease? And does high blood cholesterol correlate with higher death rates? Yes, yes. And the people who claim otherwise are using very skewed research, all right? And I'll tell you how they did it. It's kind of an interesting story. So there used to be a lot of research on a couple of things, smoking and cholesterol. And after a while, with smoking and cholesterol, not all studies show that smoking increases your risk of cancer, and not all studies show that eating cholesterol raises your but, but most do. And so the government actually made a decision a few years ago. They're not going to fund research anymore so much on those issues, because once you get to the place where you're kind of coming up with the same solution all the time, you want to take those scarce resources and allocate them to something you don't know, right? I guess like the alcohol study we talked about earlier. But actually, they do try to allocate to things you want to find out about. Well, the Egg Board in particular looked at that as a great opportunity, and they started conducting studies on their own. And how you can skew a study to show that eating cholesterol doesn't matter is you take people who are already eating a high cholesterol diet, and you reach a certain saturation point. Like if you're eating six or 700 milligrams of cholesterol a day, you can add a lot more to the diet, and it won't make any difference in your plasma cholesterol. And then you can pronounce to the world eating three eggs a day doesn't increase your cholesterol level. So they funded some studies like this. And then they started doing meta-analyses that only involve studies published since they started doing the studies, because you can include in your inclusion criteria only recent studies that cover a particular time span. And so then you can pronounce to the world that eating cholesterol doesn't increase your cholesterol rate. So very fraudulent activity, and people who are parroting this really don't understand what they're talking about, that it doesn't matter. In a dose-dependent manner, even at lower levels of increased plasma cholesterol, you see an increased risk of disease. And I'll tell you something else that should scare people a little bit. Um, it has been observed for a very long time that people who are diagnosed with cancer often have low cholesterol. And so some of the non-scientific crowd out there who jump on any correlation and try to turn it into a story started telling people, see, low cholesterol is bad for you because it can lead to cancer. Well, as it turns out, once, you're, once you have cancer cells growing in your body, one of their preferred fuels until they build the network of blood vessels needed to increase their glucose intake, because they, they take in about 18 times the glucose as regular cells, they munch on plasma cholesterol. The more of it you have, the fatter they can get before they build their networks to the, the, through um, uh, additional blood vessels to, to feed them glucose. So that's why their cholesterol levels are low at the time of diagnosis. It's because the cancer cells have been chomping on cholesterol for a good, time, good long time. So it's not low cholesterol causes cancer. It's having cancer can result in low cholesterol. What is the mechanism that causes cholesterol to cause heart disease? Well, cholesterol is a marker. Plasma cholesterol, nobody dies of cholesterol. Cholesterol is a marker that your body is depositing fat into plaque. It's building plaque in the arteries. And so that's the real thing that causes cancer is you build these plaques full of all this fatty material. And the, the cap on the plaque is like a single layer of endothelial cells, very unstable. And the arteries start to narrow. People become dehydrated and 60% of blood plasma is water. So now the blood is sticky and viscous, trying to push through a narrowed artery. And it's not hard to rupture one of those unstable plaques, and the contents spill into the vessel, and, and uh, you end up with a clot. That's what causes your heart attack, or if it's in the brain, a stroke. So cholesterol is a marker that bad things are happening. It's a sign. Based on all your scientific research, review of nutritional studies, and your personal experience, what advice would you give a person who has chronic kidney disorder? Well, there are a lot of different kinds of kidney disorders, um, and some of them can be solved by just drinking enough water. A lot of people are dehydrated. Um, but the leading dietary cause of kidney disease is eating a high-protein diet. It stresses the kidneys in incredible ways because the, the breakdown of amino acids involves releasing nitrogen and nitrogen throws off toxic byproducts like urea and um, ammonia, and your, kidney has to, your kidneys have to detoxify that stuff. So um, eating a very low protein diet if, you're, if you have kidney disease is your best chance of surviving for a long time and pro potentially avoiding dialysis. Should people get colonoscopies? 
you know, there's not a single randomized trial that has ever demonstrated that to ha having a colonoscopy reduces your risk of dying of colon cancer. And as a screening tool, it doesn't have much usefulness. As a diagnostic tool, perhaps. Canada took it off um, the screening list, the standard screening list, and I think it was in 2016. And they basically said there's no evidence to support it. Um, you can use what's called a FIT test, which is an at-home stool test, easier to do, and it's about 79% accurate. Uh, doesn't involve the risks associated with colonoscopy itself. I mean, for, just to give you an idea, for, to benefit one person, because there's always somebody that benefits from almost anything you do, you got to do 1,250 colonoscopies to benefit one person. And for every one person, you're going to kill or hurt, hurt or kill another. There really aren't good data that, that compel people to want to get colonoscopies. Um, so the FIT test doesn't carry any risk associated with it and um, uh, is probably a little more accurate because colonoscopy doesn't really catch anything on the right side of the colon very well, and that's where the most aggressive tumors are anyway. What diet and lifestyle choices should people choose to prevent or deal with constipation? Constipation is a result of usually diet and hydration. So you have to have two things to have a good bowel movement. One is you need a high fiber diet because it moves everything through the system. The other thing is you need a lot of water because water gets absorbed by the fiber, plumps it all up, and then it starts putting pressure on the walls to, of the GI tract to move things down. So even people who eat a plant-based diet sometimes don't drink enough water, and that's a point of contention in the community a little bit, people thinking that if they get enough water from fruits and vegetables, they don't have to, they, they are getting enough water from fruits and vegetables and don't need to drink water, but you actually do, right? Um, so those are the two things. Now, having said that, there are some people who've been constipated for so long, they've damaged their gut microbiome, um, their GI tract has to be retrained to have a bowel movement. Uh, many of them are addicted to laxatives or enemas. They have all kinds of strategies or supplements that they take that help their bowels move. And it takes a while to retrain the bowel. And we found that weaning people off of those things um, gradually is, is helpful because they, if you don't take the magnesium anymore, you just stop having bowel movements. So they go back on the magnesium. So a gradual weaning process is sometimes the best way to do it. What is wrong with milk, cheese, and yogurt, and what proof is there to support your opinion? Well, the problem with, with dairy products, any, any kind of animal milk at all, is first of all, they contain hormones, estrogen and estrogen metabolites, because it comes from pregnant and lactating animals. And um, for both men and women, this is not a good idea. I mean, one of the leading causes of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, they're estrogen positive, usually estrogen receptor positive, so you don't want to increase your risk of those things. Um, for men, the risk is uh, the risk of the man will develop prostate cancer. Um, having a couple servings of dairy every day is higher than the risk that a smoker will develop lung cancer. That's pretty significant. Um, dairy is one of the leading causes of juvenile diabetes in genetically susceptible children because the, the proteins in dairy, um, some of them have amino acid chains that very closely resemble the amino acid chains that make up the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And so an autoimmune response to undigested proteins in the, in the bloodstream, which happens when kids have had a lot of antibiotics, they have a leaky gut, is that the antibodies will go after those pancreatic cells. It's what we call it molecular mimicry. It's when your, your immune system becomes a little bit confused because something that it targeted, dairy protein, looks a lot like a tissue in the body. Where do dietitians and nutritionists get their information on nutrition and disease reversal, and are they getting accurate information? Most of them not, and that's true of both traditional dietetics, and it's also true of alternative views of nutrition. Um, a lot of these training programs for nutrition basically are supplement focused. They turn them into, they turn these people into holistic pharmacists. Um, another common thing in the alternative side of it, and I'll talk about dietetics in a minute, is um, this idea that, you know, teaching moderation, different diets for different people, you know, there, there's a right diet for, for creatures on the planet. When you go to a veterinarian, I've, I've had pets all my life, and veterinarians will tell you there's a real specific diet for cats. You don't feed it to them, they die. And if you have gerbils or you have dogs or you have, you know, there are very specific diets for these critters. Humans are the same thing. We're just another mammal. So the, so the bottom line, that one, of the, one of the biggest problems with nutritionist training, non-dietetics, is it's not based on much science. 
So, and, and this, this is again a big problem we have, is over here if there's no science, we go over here with different ideas but no science, we haven't really changed anything. The problem with dietetics is it's very closely allied. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics very closely allied with the USDA's dietary guidelines. In fact, almost every year that the guidelines, when they come out with new ones, the president of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics will write a great letter saying, congratulations you know, for looking at the science and coming up with the best stuff, and we can't wait to get our dietitians on board for helping Americans implement this, right? So there's a, there's a big tie to, to USDA guidelines, and then the Academy takes in millions of dollars a year from, from sponsors. Makes it very difficult for dietitians to give, um, who are allied with them, to give independent um, uh, advice. Now having said that, there are, just like there's some marvelous doctors who have recognized the limitation of their training and they've gone off in a different direction with what they're doing, there are some marvelous dietitians. Some of them are friends of mine. We employ uh, one of them at our office who has the right idea about this. And um, so we have to be careful we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but, but the training in general for health professionals of all stripes is terrible. It's terrible, and it's just as bad on the alternative side as it is on the traditional side. Please tell us what you eat for dinner on a typical day and be as specific as possible. Okay, well, you know, being a creature of habit, these are easy questions for me to answer. So um, lunches and dinners are kind of the same. I, I eat about five times a day, and I told you about my breakfast. And then for other meals, for like lunch and dinner, I like great big salads. Like if you saw the salads I make, you would think that's dinner for six. I eat it all, okay, because I eat, I eat a ton of produce. Um, and then the, the starch part of my meal, I like sweet potatoes a lot. And one of the things I'll do on the weekend because I'm so busy is I'll bake up, um, I'll slice sweet potatoes and bake cookie trays of them, like 10 or 15 pounds of sweet potatoes. So those you can microwave real fast and you know quick dinner so I can have two or three sweet potatoes. Um, another thing I do is make vegetable and rice dishes that um, I can you know, make a big, great big pot. Uh, soups in the wintertime, like black bean chili and that sort of thing, and I can warm that up. Um, let's see, what else do I, squash. One of my favorite things is uh, butternut squash chopped up with uh, brown and wild rice with some cracked pepper on top, love that, you know. So, you know, wraps. Um, I'll, make, I'll take any of that and put it in a wrap, not the chili obviously, but the beans and rice and, and um, vegetables and rice and all that sort of thing, I can put that in a wrap and, and even eat that on the go. So those are the kinds of things I eat. And then late at night, I always eat something before I go to bed or shortly before, and that's usually fruit. Um, and I found this wonderful decadent thing. It's called um, uh, chocolate balsamic vinegar. It's infused with chocolate flavor, no fat, and if you put this in the fridge, it gets that um, the syrupy consistency of like chocolate syrup. So berries with this balsamic chocolate balsamic vinegar, it's so decadent you can't believe it. No guilt. So a lot of times that's a big late night thing at my house. Great big bowl of fruit with uh, this chocolate vinegar. What diseases can't be cured? How do you manage them? Things like lupus. Well. Any disease, I don't think we can say any disease, you always get cure. Um, so what you have to do is do as much as you can and then see what you're left with. And then you do as much as you can to, to keep it from progressing. You know, sometimes when we work with people, the best that we can achieve is it's not going to get worse. And that's a win. You know, if, if you look at multiple sclerosis patients, within 10 years, if they have traditional treatment, most of them are walking with assistance or in a wheelchair. So if you're walking with assistance and we keep you out of the chair, this is a win. You may not be running a marathon next week, but this is better. So I think it's very important that we don't overpromise what diet and lifestyle changes can do because that's, it's unethical. It, it borders on what the medical profession does, is promise things that they can't deliver. Um, it depends on the disease what you do. Uh, even cancer can become a chronic disease. We, uh, we have people who have had cancer for 20 some years. Not getting worse, not getting better. Well, it's sort of like being a type one diabetic. You can't cure it, but insulin lets you live your full lifespan if you do everything else right. So I think we have to be careful we don't overpromise. I think we have to be careful that we don't think that if you can't re reverse it, that, that bad things are gonna happen, not always. 
things can become chronic diseases. Um, and then you do the best you can. One uh, example I'll give you is I have a, a, a woman I know uh, who has a case of rheumatoid arthritis. It's the worst I've ever seen, most aggressive. She's never taken any drugs. Um, she's fasted. She eats an optimal diet. She did an elimination diet and picked out a few tr triggers that seem to make her more uncomfortable. She doesn't eat those things. Um, she eats optimally. She's found that heat is very helpful. She comes to hot yoga a couple, three times a week. Um, and there's a little bit of misshapenness in the joints. I mean, you wouldn't notice it unless you, if I told you, you would notice it when you saw her, but she's kept that to a minimum. She can still button her blouses. And, and so my point is this woman is uh, almost the same age as I am. And by working hard at this, she's managed to um, really slow down the progression of this disease. And she's doesn't, there's nothing she can't do right now. And that's the best that we can hope for. I mean, I'd love for it to be gone. It isn't, you know. But we're, she's doing everything she can, and it's working out pretty well. It's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. really. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them like that. You can't get rid of it. I had a guy that lived with chronic lymphocytic leukemia for 22 years, died at 89 years old, and not of that, by the way. Um, with a little bit of chemotherapy here and there, he used to call, call it getting some juice. He had a great oncologist who, who was on board with this, and every time the numbers would pop up a little bit, he'd, he'd go see his oncologist, get a little chemo, and that would kind of tame it down. Never went away. I mean, there was just a, we could not get beneath one number, but, but um, he had a great life for 20 some years, you know. If a whole food plant-based diet is the healthiest diet, then why is it not recommended by doctors, government officials, media, health agencies, or other people in positions of influence? All right, well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Let's start with doctors. Doctors don't get any nutrition training in school. It's not their fault. Um, and they also don't necessarily get much training in scrutinizing medical information to choose treatments. In fact, residency was one of the best things that ever happened in medicine. It started at Johns Hopkins because doctors used to go to medical school and then they go practice on people <laughs> without any supervision. But what it's kind of turned into now is a way to uh, pass on bad practices gen generation to generation. So there's not a lot of thinking going on with doctors, unfortunately. Uh, there are a lot here at this conference that are a different ilk. Again, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but that's the problem with doctors. They don't get nutrition training, and they're not necessarily trained to say, how can I fix this? This isn't working. Giving, giving drugs, giving metformin to type 2 diabetics, they're not getting better. Maybe I should look for something else. Um, the government is in a very conflicted situation. You know, the United States Department of Agriculture was an agency created by um, uh, Congress during Abraham Lincoln's administration. People love to hate the USDA, but I'm going to tell you something. They did a lot of good work in the beginning. These are the people who went out and told farmers, you can't just torch the land and keep moving west because sooner or later you're going to be at the Pacific Ocean, right? So, so it started out pretty well. What, what happened that changed everything for the worst was when the USDA decided that as an agency they would take on dietary guidelines for Americans. So it's a conflict. It's an institutional conflict that can't ever be resolved. You're supposed to advocate for farmers. I like eating. You like eating. Food's an important part of our economy. I don't think anybody sane is going to say we don't need an agency that maybe helps those people. But they ha in order to do the right thing diet-wise, they would have to tell, the officials at the USDA would have to tell Americans to eat less of some of the things that the farmers are producing. That won't work. It's never going to happen. So that's the problem with the government. And then the media just reports what it's told. Um, and, and they're increasingly becoming so lazy, they report anything they're told, which is why you see constantly stories being retracted about political issues. They don't retract stories that are incorrect about medicine. They just go on to the next headline. Or so uh, the media, and, and the other problem the media has is they can't be too terribly critical because they take advertising money from the companies that make the foods that they probably should be reporting aren't so good for you. And by the way, that's a problem in medical journals. Medical journals make a fortune on drug company advertising and also on reprints of favorable drug company advertising. Millions of dollars change hands that way. So if you're going to print an article this month, is it going to be telling why the XYZ drug is great for 16 other things you didn't know about or that eating plants might help you get better? So lots of things. I mean, we could do a whole day. I teach a whole class on that, by the way. It's called Nutritional Issues and Controversies. It's 18 hours of lecture and 18 hours of paper writing and research. So it's a deep topic we could talk about for a long time. 
Why don't doctors recommend vegan diets? They don't know. They just don't know. And, and here's, here's the thing too, you know, I'm hard on doctors. I think that came out in this interview. But, but let's look at things from a doctor's perspective, all right, on the other side. Many doctors, most doctors who have been in practice for a long time, have never seen a person really get well through diet. They, here's, here's a typical thing that happens. Doctors tell their people all the time, you need to lose weight, you need to eat a better diet. You know, don't eat so much fat, don't eat so much junk food. The, the advice is too generic, nobody knows what to do about it, but it's well-intentioned. And patients say, that's right, I'm gonna lower my cholesterol, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna eat better. And then they go out and practice moderation, whatever that means, and a lot of other stuff that doesn't work. And so next six months later, they come in to get their prescription refilled, and they're a little bit fatter and sicker than they were six months ago. That's what a doctor sees all the time. So you didn't learn about it in school, and you've never seen anybody actually recover their health with diet. So this reinforces the belief that it really doesn't matter. And, and you'll hear doctors say this all the time. I tell my people to, I tell patients to eat better and lose weight. They don't do it. Well, you're not telling them anything usable. I mean, if we just went out and pulled people out of the hotel lobby here who weren't associated with this conference and said, I want you to eat right and, and lose weight, how are you gonna do it? They'd say, um, I guess I'll eat right <laughs> and lose weight. They don't know what that means. You have to teach people. We, we offer an eight hour course that, that's just the beginning. This is how to get started. Lots more you need to know, but this is just the details you need to know so you know what to start eating. You know, so, so that's why. It's a, it's a very messy situation, and it's going to take a long time to unravel, actually.